More than a year in advance, the Allies began planning a massive invasion of Nazi-occupied France, codenamed Operation Overlord. And the United States put General Dwight Eisenhower in command of Operation Overlord. We're going to hear a lot more about Eisenhower as time goes on. And they chose Normandy as the crossing place on the English Channel, precisely because it was the least likely spot on the English Channel to cross. It was the longest point. Uh, the Germans expected that they would cross, try to cross near Charbourg, France, which was further to the north. Uh, but they chose Normandy. Uh, there was rough weather in early June 1944, uh, but finally on the 6th of June they launched Operation Overlord. Uh, they sent paratroopers in the night before to try to cut German communications from the rear. Most of these paratroopers went off course, and on the morning of June 6th, 1944, the Allies struck the beaches at Normandy. Some of the Allied convoys went off course and struck the most heavily German fortified positions at Utah and Omaha beaches. That's where the Allies sustained the most casualties on what became known as D-Day. It was actually the largest flotilla of ships ever assembled in the history of the world. And, of course, the German defenders were shocked on the morning of June 6th to see the Allies coming out of the fog and landing on the beaches terrible casualties as the Allies fought their way up the beaches, but by the end of the day, they had secured a foothold, and they had breached the German fortifications and secured a foothold there on the beaches of Normandy. You can see here images of U.S. troops in landing boats as they approached the beaches at Normandy, and there on the bottom right-hand side, as they actually landed on the beaches and the bottom left, you can see them crouching behind obstructions. Those obstructions were meant to rip the hulls out of approaching boats at high tide. But you can see the U.S. troops here hiding behind those obstructions, trying to make their way up the beaches, trying not to drown, trying to avoid incoming German machine gun fire from the pillboxes there and the heavily armed German defenses on the beach. Despite the fact that the Allies had gained a foothold on the beaches of Normandy, the Germans kept them pinned down around the beaches. Finally, General Omar Bradley and his, and his troops were able to punch a hole through the German lines at the Battle of St. Lo on July 25, 1944. And that was enough to let General George Patton's division rush through. Uh, Patton and Bradley together trapped a quarter million German troops up against the English Channel and captured them at the Battle of Falaise. And the Allies then quickly liberated Paris on August 25th, 1944. You can see here on the right-hand side the village of St. Lo after the battle there. And on the bottom left, Allied troops marching underneath the Arc de Triomphe after having liberated Paris. The Allies reached the Rhine by September of 1944, but they had to halt to regroup. Hitler took advantage of this delay and threw 25 divisions against the Allied positions in the Ardennes Forest in Belgium, beginning on December 16, 1944. The battle lasted more than a month until January 25, 1945. It was known as the Battle of the Bulge because where the Germans almost broke through in the center of the line, there was a concave bulge in the map uh, in the Allied lines. And the Germans would have broken through if it hadn't been for the 101st Air Division, led by General Anthony McAuliffe, uh, dug in at the village, Crossroads Village of Bastogne. When the Germans sent in a note for McAuliffe to surrender, he sent back out a one-word reply, nuts. The 101st Airborne held out long enough at Bastogne to give time for the cloud cover to clear for Allied air cover to come in and break the German siege of Bastogne. And so this was the German last-ditch effort to stop the Allies from advancing on Berlin and after this, in January 1945, the U.S. began their final advance uh, toward the heart of Germany.
You can see here images from the Battle of the Bulge. It was extraordinarily cold, the dead of winter in Belgium. The men froze to death. You can see there uh, a German soldier on the left, on the upper right-hand side, a U.S. soldier struggling with the, the ammunition belt of his machine gun, which is frozen in place. In January of 1945, the Soviets, coordinating with the Americans and the British, launched a massive assault from the east on Germany. The Americans crossed the Rhine River on March 7, 1945. And on April 30, 1945, with Soviet troops in the suburbs of Berlin, Hitler committed suicide in his bunker in Berlin. On May 7, 1945, General Dwight Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, accepted the unconditional surrender of Germany in what was known as VE Day, or Victory Europe. German civilians suffered terribly as Soviet troops advanced toward Berlin. You can see here Soviet troops raising uh, the flag in Berlin, and upper left-hand side you can see the body of Adolf Hitler. Uh, of course, Hitler's body was captured by the Soviets and kept by them uh, ultimately, of course, uh, they had the body cremated and dumped into a, a river at an undisclosed location so as not to create a shrine. As the Soviets and the Americans advanced further into Germany, German-occupied territory, they began to discover the horrible truth of the genocide carried out by the Third Reich, uh, the genocide that has come to be known as the Holocaust. As early as 1933, when Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, uh, he and the Nazi High Command began targeting what they called undesirables for uh, either ghettos or work camps. Ultimately, of course, in the end for extermination, undesirables were first and foremost Jews, but also communists, Romani people, homosexuals, communists, uh, anyone who could pose a threat to uh, the fascist regime of the Nazis. In March of 1933, the Nazis opened the first of the concentration camps, including the model camp at Dachau. A sign above the gates of Dachau read, Arbeit macht frei, work will set you free. In April of 1933, Hermann Goering, seen picture here, helped create the Gestapo, or German secret police, to help round up the undesirables. One of the key parts of the Nazi program was to destroy anything that resembled multiculturalism, anything that resembled tolerance, anything that resembled knowledge or wisdom. And so they began burning books. Here you have a Nazi book burning uh, in 1933. Between 1933 and 1935, the Nazis passed a series of laws disenfranchising Jews and other, quote, undesirables. The peak of these laws came at Nuremberg in 1935 when the Nazis passed a series of race laws. Uh, principally, the key part of the Nuremberg race laws prevented intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews. The Nazis actually patterned the Nuremberg race laws on anti-miscegenation laws that they had taken from the states here in the United States. One of the most disturbing parts of the Nazi reign of terror was the sheer number of ideas that the Nazis gleaned from the United States. Hitler was a big fan of the American West, of Westerns, of American culture in that regard. And so he loved what the United States had done in terms of putting Native Americans on reservations. And that was where Hitler got the idea to put Jews into ghettos and into work camps. Uh, another area that the Nazis took their cues from Americans was in the area of eugenics. Of course, it was American scientists who'd headed up the eugenics movement to try to create the perfect human being in the 1920s. And it was the Nazis who took up where the Americans left off in the 1930s. In 1936, Heinrich Himmler was appointed chief of the German police, including the SS. Himmler there pictured upper right-hand side center 
The Waffen SS were the elite of the elite. They were patterned after the Jesuit order. Every young patriotic boy in Germany wanted to be a member of the Waffen SS. They were that popular, that lionized, and they became the spearhead of the Nazi effort. They became the guards of the camps. They became the executioners. They became the most hardcore soldiers that Germany had to offer during World War II. In what became known as Kristallnacht, or the Night of the Broken Glass, November 9, 1938, the Nazis launched a massive attack on Jews throughout Germany, uh, smashed synagogues, destroyed houses, and the next morning they began marching Jews off to males uh, off to concentration camps and off to ghettos. Within these recreated medieval ghettos in German cities, Jews were forced to wear yellow stars of David to identify themselves. They were given starvation rations, crammed into unlivable quarters, and placed into work and concentration camps. And then in 1939, after the German invasion of Poland, they discovered that they had so many Jews on their hands that they came up with what was called the final solution to the Jewish problem. Uh, the final solution, they would begin executing Jews by firing squads in the camps. One of the chief architects of the final solution, the man tasked with organizing and managing the logistics involved in the mass deportation of Jews to ghettos in the extermination camps, was Adolf Eichmann, whom you see pictured here. Eichmann actually escaped at the end of the war, and he was actually hiding and built a new life for himself in Argentina, and was actually captured by Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service in Argentina on May, in May of 1960. He was taken back to Israel, tried for war crimes in Jerusalem, and hanged in 1962. As the final solution was being implemented, they also began designing extermination camps strictly for the purpose of executions and extermination. The largest of these camps, of course, was Auschwitz-Birkenau in Poland. And this is the testimony of the commandant of Auschwitz after the war. After the war, there was a series of trials of Nazi war criminals at Nuremberg, known as the Nuremberg Trials. And the commandant of Auschwitz gave this testimony at Nuremberg. He said, quote, We had two SS doctors on duty at Auschwitz to examine the incoming transports of prisoners. The prisoners would be marched by one of the doctors who would make spot decisions as they walked by. Those who were fit for work were sent into the camp. Others were sent immediately to the extermination plants. Children of tender years were invariably exterminated, since by reason of their youth they were unable to work. End quote. The main problem from the perspective of Himmler and the SS was that using firing squads to execute prisoners was distressing for those that had to do the shooting. It was messy. It cost bullets that could be used for fighting at the front. And so Nazi scientists reverse engineered Zyklon B uh, from a commercially available pesticide. Uh, Zyklon B, when exposed to the air, gives off cyanide gas. And in January of 1942, they began deploying Zyklon B to gas chambers in the extermination camps. They would herd prisoners in, told they would be deloused and showered before going into the work camps. And they would herd them in. There were shower heads affixed to the walls of the gas chambers. After the prisoners had all been placed in naked, they'd been divested of their clothing, any valuables, a, an SS officer would climb to the roof of the chamber open up a small grate, and dump in a series of Zyklon B pellets that release cyanide gas, 
and then the screaming would start. And after about 10 minutes, the screaming would go quiet. And they would then open up the doors, disentangle the bodies, and take them to crematoriums that had been constructed there in the, in the extermination camps. And in this way, they murdered millions and millions of people. The reason that the Holocaust is so well documented is that the Germans were excellent record keepers. They kept records of everything. Most of these records were captured by the Allies at the end of the war. This is a portion of a speech that Himmler gave to a, a secret meeting of party officials during the war. He said, quote, I shall speak to you here with all frankness of a very serious subject. We shall now discuss it absolutely openly among ourselves. Nevertheless, we shall never speak of it in public. I mean the evacuation of the Jews, the extermination of the Jewish race. It is one of those things which is easy to say. The Jewish race is to be exterminated, says every party member. That's clear. It's part of our program. Elimination of the Jews. Extermination. Right. We'll do it. Most of you know what it means to see a hundred corpses lying together. Five hundred or a thousand. To have gone through this and yet, apart from a few exceptions, examples of human weakness, to have remained decent fellows. This is what has made us hard. This is a glorious page in our history. End quote. You can see a map here of the major concentration camps and death camps as they existed across Germany and Poland, France, the Netherlands, Czechoslovakia at the time. Uh, in fact, in all, all told, there were over 1,400 work and death camps. We often talk about the 6 million Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust, and there were 6 million Jews murdered in the Holocaust. But there were also 8 million non-Jews that the Nazis murdered. Uh, Romani, homosexuals, Seventh-day Adventists, just a whole host of people. So the total cost of German genocide was actually closer to 14 million. The Holocaust is the best documented genocide in human history. We have millions of photographs, video that was taken at the time. There are some that out of pure anti-Semitism and evil deny that the Holocaust ever happened. They deny that as many victims died as actually died, but these Holocaust deniers are either extremely anti-Semitic or neo-Nazis themselves. You can see here some of the images from the Holocaust. These are some of the bodies that were killed by starvation firing squads. You can see here more images. The image at the top right is shoes shoes of people that were confiscated before they went into the gas chambers. Some of the prisoners, when the Nazis tried to blow up the rail lines to the camps and hide the camps as the Soviets advanced, some of the prisoners were too sick to move. Some of those prisoners that were too sick for the Nazis to take with them are pictured here. And although the Allies tried to save them, most of those pictured here were actually so sick that they actually still died. There were nine and a half million Jews living in Europe in 1933. The Holocaust claimed the lives of 5.9 million of them, 63%. The Holocaust killed 91% of Polish Jews, 74% of Hungarian Jews, 84% of Latvian Jews, and the number goes on and on. Meanwhile, on a lighter note, back on the home front, World War II created an economic explosion in the United States. Uh, revenue uh, from, rose from set, uh, increased by $7 billion alone in 1942. The federal government also increased its spending from $9 billion a year of spending in 1940 to $98 billion a year of spending in 1944. This is the most the U.S. government ever spent. Ultimately, we were spending roughly 98% of GDP on the war effort. Uh, 
And that is what finally pulled us out of the Great Depression and created essentially full employment. You can see here a woman working in a factory. Young men left their homes in droves to join the U.S. military forces. Arguably, World War II is the most popular war ever fought by the United States. Nine million people moved to defense centers to meet the, to meet the needs of the defense industry. Places like Norfolk, San Diego, and Mobile all grew by more than 50% during the war. And women began taking jobs uh, so as to free men to go to the front. You can see here a, an American propaganda poster, Victory Waits on Your Fingers, Keep Them Flying, Miss USA, advertising for uh, secretaries for uh, the Army Air Corps. World War II also sped up the process of African-American migration away from the Deep South, away from the strictures of Jim Crow. Uh, so. 300,000 African Americans moved to the West Coast, over half a million to the Midwest, 600,000 to the Northeast, and these African American men that signed up in large numbers for the U.S. Armed Forces and worked in defense industries, and this turned racial questions into national questions, and the returning veterans from the Second World War, uh, these men are really what helped spark the post-World War II civil rights movement. Fearing that Japanese Americans could become a fifth column in the United States, subversives, in 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt began the process of forcing 120,000 Japanese Americans, Nisei, out of their homes and placing them into detention centers throughout the South and the West. The camps were surrounded by barbed wire and armed guards. In 1944, the Supreme Court upheld the detentions as a wartime necessity and as legal. Those that survived the camps finally in 1988, the Congress voted a $1.2 billion indemnity to those that survived. Uh, of course, those that were still surviving in 1988 had been small children at the time of their detention. This is one of the worst human rights abuses carried out by the United States government during World War II. Meanwhile, in politics in 1940, Franklin Roosevelt won a, an unprecedented third term to the presidency over Republican Wendell Wilkie as the United States hurtled toward involvement in World War II. In 1944, Franklin Roosevelt wanted to seek a fourth term for the presidency. Of course, that would be unheard of, but Roosevelt was still overwhelmingly popular with the American people. And so the Democratic Party told Roosevelt that he could run for a fourth term. They would nominate him for a fourth term on one condition. And that condition was that he drop his vice president, Henry Wallace. Wallace had replaced John Nance Garner as vice president in 1941. Henry Wallace, though, former Secretary of Agriculture, was far too liberal for most Democrats. And instead, the Democratic Party, in what was known as the Second Missouri Compromise, chose Senator Harry Truman of Missouri as the vice presidential nominee, knowing full well that Truman may have to take over the presidency in the case of Roosevelt's death. Uh, Roosevelt's health had begun to suffer by that time, and so that's why the Democrats insisted on being able to name his vice president. Truman was far more conservative than Wallace, and so this was the second Missouri Compromise. Roosevelt and Truman, running against Republican nominee Thomas Dewey, won the presidency overwhelmingly in 1940, giving Roosevelt a fourth term as U.S. president. After Roosevelt's death in 1951, the United States would amend the Constitution to limit a president to two terms in office. At Yalta on the Crimean Peninsula in February of 1945, the Big Three met for one of the last times. Franklin Roosevelt, Joseph Stalin, Premier of the Soviet Union, and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Uh, 
And out of this meeting came the Yalta Accords. Roosevelt agreed to allow Stalin to keep control of Eastern Europe to some degree. Uh, Stalin promised to come in to the war against Japan two or three months after a German surrender. And the Yalta Accords were viewed by some as Roosevelt selling out to Stalin. Roosevelt felt he could handle Stalin. He was wrong. Roosevelt later admitted that he was wrong to allow Stalin so much leeway at Yalta. But looking at it in hindsight, Roosevelt did obtain a promise from Stalin to enter the war against Japan that was more than the United States could even get out of Great Britain. Because in Great Britain, Churchill pushed for the British to enter the war against Japan after a German surrender, and the British would not. You can see here that even in this grainy picture of the big three at Yalta, Stalin on the right, Churchill on the left, Roosevelt in the center, Churchill hated Stalin so much he refused to even sit next to him. Roosevelt looks old and sick in this image, and in fact, he was very sick by this time. And this image about sums it up. Uh, Yalta, of course, was one of Stalin's favorite vacation spots. Churchill and Roosevelt had, tra had to travel long distances to get there. They were exhausted, and Roosevelt was worn out from the diplomacy and from trying to extract promises from Stalin and from Churchill. After his return from Yalta on April 12, 1945, while vacationing at his home in Warm Springs, Georgia, President Franklin Roosevelt died in office. And at that point, Roosevelt's death placed the United States and the Allies as a whole in the hands of this relatively inexperienced senator from Missouri, Harry S. Truman. You can see Truman pictured here, and Truman would have to oversee an end to the Second World War. Not only a German surrender, which would not come until early May, but also, of course, how to finish defeating the Japanese. By the time of Roosevelt's death, the Germans had been all but defeated. Truman's real task was to, was to, uh, to defeat the Japanese. Admiral Nimitz pushed back the Japanese from their island strongholds in the Battle of the Philippine Sea in June of 1944 and the Battle of Leyte Gulf. The Allies began pushing the Japanese back toward their home islands. General MacArthur managed to clear the last Japanese defender off of the island of New Guinea in early 1944. In the Battles of the Philippine Sea and Leyte Gulf, pictured here, the Japanese had begun to use kamikaze pilots. Uh, Japanese Zero pilots would load up their planes with explosives and gasoline and run uh, suicide missions to destroy U.S. vessels by crashing into them. Uh, the picture on the bottom left is a haunting image. You can see the Japanese Zero headed straight for the command bridge where the photographer, along with other men, are standing uh, this was the last thing that that photographer would ever see, that kamikaze headed for the command bridge. Japanese resistance stiffened on the island of Iwo Jima. Uh, the Americans wanted to capture Iwo Jima because the island possessed a, an airstrip close enough to the Japanese home islands that they could begin bombing the Japanese home islands around the clock. In February 1945, members of the 1st Marine Division landed on the beaches of Iwo Jima, and for 36 days they fought with the Japanese for control of the island. The Japanese were dug in with an elaborate series of tunnels all over the island, and it really was uphill fighting for the Americans. One of the advantages, though, the Americans had developed in the Pacific was that they were able to use Navajo code talkers to defeat the Japanese. To prevent the Japanese from breaking their code, the U.S. government actually had linguists travel to Navajo reservations in Arizona and help the Navajo develop a written version of their language. And they then recruited Navajo code talkers to communicate with American troops 
and the Japanese never did crack the Navajo code. On the left, you can see American Marines going ashore on the beaches of Iwo Jima. On the other end of the island, you can see the high point of the island, Mount Suribachi. And you can see U.S. troops raising the flag at the top of the mountain there on the right-hand side. This photograph became perhaps the most iconic photograph of World War II. The World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. is based on it. But this photograph was actually staged. When the troops first got to the top of the mountain, they actually raised a flag that they had with them. And there was a photographer with them who said, you know, this flag is too small. It doesn't make a good photograph. So he actually had some of the men go back down the mountain through enemy fire and get a larger flag and a larger flag pole. And they then photographed this staged raising of the flag. This is really the second raising of the flag on Iwo Jima. One of the reasons that the war in the Pacific was so was fought so tough by both sides is that both sides had turned the war into a racialized conflict. Uh, they both sides used racist xenophobic propaganda against the other. If you watch American propaganda and even cartoons during the war, you can see how they treated the Japanese. Just It was extraordinarily racist. Uh, the Japanese were led to believe that U.S. Marines were degenerates who would defile uh, their wives and children if they surrendered. And so all of this racializing of the war in the Pacific led to even harder fighting, tougher fighting uh, like that at Iwo Jima. Another American island that they, another island that the Americans targeted for capture was Okinawa, which also possessed a an airstrip close enough to bomb the Japanese home islands. And from April to June of 1945, the Americans struggled with the Japanese for control of Okinawa, finally capturing the island in June of 1945. After the battles of Okinawa and Iwo Jima, the United States began firebombing the Japanese around the clock. Most Japanese cities at that time were still built with wooden buildings, and the firebombings had completely destroyed Tokyo and most of the other infrastructure in Japan. Civilian casualties were awful. I mean, the Americans were firebombing Dresden, Germany at the same time, too, late in 1945 at the end of the war. These are terrible atrocities. But as the Americans closed in, the Japanese did not appear to be willing to surrender unconditionally. The Japanese were willing to surrender, provided that they could keep the office of the emperor. But the cult of the emperor and emperor worship in the minds of the Americans had been one of the key causes of Japanese expansionism and the beginning of the war. And so there were some strategy makers that began talking about an invasion of the Japanese home islands, but that was out of the question. They argued it would cost millions of American lives. The negotiated peace was off the table because the Japanese insisted on keeping the office of the emperor. They were willing to surrender, provided they got to keep the emperor. They, the U.S. could keep up the firebombing. The Strategic Bombing Command said that they could keep it up until December, if not longer, and the Japanese would eventually have to surrender. But there was also another option. At that point in the summer of 1945, the use of the top secret Manhattan Project. Beginning in 1939, even before U.S. involvement in World War II, the U.S. government had devoted $2 billion to develop an atomic bomb based on the fission of radioactive uranium and plutonium. Of course, this is all theoretical. American physicists discovered the ability to create and control a splitting of an atom, a small nuclear explosion on December 2nd, 1942 at the University of Chicago. And the Manhattan Project was carried out at the University of Chicago, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Richland, Washington, and Los Alamos, New Mexico. The physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer headed up the Los Alamos location. You can see here Oppenheimer consulting with Albert Einstein. Einstein, of course, whose theories and ideas made the atomic bomb possible.
By the summer of 1945, the United States had constructed three atomic bombs, the Fat Man, the Little Boy, and the Davy Crockett. And they opted to test the Davy Crockett at the Trinity site at Los Alamos. On July 16, 1945, they detonated the Davy Crockett. Uh, the theoretical explosion actually did happen. It took about 20 minutes after they had planned. They were actually taking bets as to whether or not the thing would go off. But when the bomb did go off, the explosion resulted in a mushroom cloud that rose 40,000 feet above the desert floor and created a fireball that was greater in intensity by greater by several times than our own sun. Uh, the blast yield of the Davy Crockett was about nine kilotons. Uh, that is 9,000 tons of TNT being detonated at once. It also gave off a tremendous amount of radiation. After the initial test on July 16, 1945, Oppenheimer and other physicists who had worked on the project began begging President Harry Truman not to use the atomic bomb as a weapon of war. He said it was too terrible, it would create too many civilian casualties. But ultimately, Truman did decide to use the bomb. And the reasons are somewhat complex. The day after the successful test, at Los Alamos, Truman was at Potsdam outside Berlin for a conference with Joseph Stalin, with the British Prime Minister, new British Prime Minister Clement Attlee, and Stalin and Truman immediately hated each other. By the end of the conference, it was clear that at the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union were on a collision course. And so Truman decided to use the bomb, not out of military necessity, but to intimidate Stalin. And it worked. The timing of the bomb also indicates uh, his uh, desire to intimidate Stalin. Truman knew that the Soviets were going to declare war on Japan 90 days after the German surrender. That would be August 7th. So on August 6th, 1945, at, uh, in, in the morning, local time, in Hiroshima, Japan, Hirosh they targeted Hiroshima because it was one of the few Japanese cities that had not been destroyed by firebombing. They dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, but they dropped it on a civilian target. They dropped it on a crowded downtown area at rush hour to create maximum civilian casualties. And that's what it did. The Soviets declared war on Japan on August 7th. And then on August 9th, the United States dropped the second atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki. This time, the citizens of Nagasaki had some warning. The air raid siren went off. And so not as many died as died at Hiroshima. But ultimately, about a quarter million Japanese civilians died in this experiment with atomic diplomacy. Truman was warned by his advisors that if the United States were to lose the war, even after dropping the bomb, that they would probably be tried as war criminals. Keep in mind that on August 14, 1945, the Japanese did in fact surrender. And when they surrendered, they kept the office of the emperor intact. That means that the United States gained exactly nothing from dropping the bomb other than intimidating the Soviets, which was the whole purpose. But on August 14, 1945, was known as VJ Day or Victory Japan, and it marked the end of World War II. You can see here the mushroom cloud that rose over Hiroshima after the dropping of the bomb and scenes from Hiroshima, just the complete devastation of the central part of Hiroshima from these bombs, these terrible, terrible weapons of mass destruction. World War II was the costliest conflict in human history. The Soviet Union lost the most, 27 million dead. We still don't have good numbers for the numbers of Chinese that died, anywhere from 10 to 20 million. Germany and Austria combined, 6 million. Poland, 6 million. Japan, 2.7 million. 
the major country that lost the fewest was the United States, and we still lost 300,000 Americans who died in this conflict for a total of almost 67 million dead worldwide.